Good morning. So I'd like to speak to you this morning about storm mixers. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how a storm mixer compares in performance to the much more commonly used style of ring. So we'll start by looking at the diode ring topology. Look at how that functions, how it works. Then we'll introduce the star mixer, which is functionally identical, but it's quite a different topology. We're then going to look at the MMIC playing out balance, and balance are critical to the performance of the MMIC based mixer. And then we'll do a comparison. We'll look at how the diode ring mixer compares in performance to the star mixer. Now, I will say this uh, presentation is not intended to decry the diode ring mixer. It's an excellent mixer. The star mixer has some advantages compared to it and, and some disadvantages, and this is what we'll be talking about. This is a, a little PCB with a, a diode ring mixer on that we designed previously. And what we're going to do is we're going to present the simulations of this diode ring mixer and compare those to a star mixer realized on exactly the same process. So this is a diode ring mixer. You have an RF input over here. This transformer structure just generates a, um, an antiphase um, equal amplitude signal here. It's just a balance. That's all it does. Takes the single-ended input, generates a differential RF. Similarly, the yellow over here has a balance, and that takes a single-ended input and generates a differential LO. Now, we don't realize why our wound transformers in an MMIC, and the vast, vast majority of mixes you'll buy today won't have transformers that look anything like this. But they're a great tool when you're starting mixer de design um, in the simulator just do some initial simulations, work out what sort of diode size you should use, what sort of LO power you need. Because they, they work in the simulation world across an infinite bandwidth. Now, we're gonna look later how we actually realize these. Now, the way this mixer works is, the LO here, it turns these pair of diodes on, and then these pair of diodes on, and it switches them in antiphase at the LO frequency. So we're grounding this port, and then this port, and all we're doing is we're routing the RF signal through to the IF at the LO frequency. So this has some nice advantages. All of the ports are inherently isolated. They're all virtual earths of each other. Uh, it's got four diodes, which improves the linearity compared to a single ended mixer. And um, it on an MMIC realization, all these diodes are identical and it works very well. Now it's very easy with a bit of trigonometry to show how you get an IF signal out by switching the RF at the LO frequency. However, I always think pictures often work better than equations. So we've got some pictures here. This is an RF waveform, it's a sinusoid. This is the LO waveform. That, that's a square wave. Now that's not to say we um, will use a square wave input. We don't need to do that. But we will be hard switching those diodes with a much larger LO signal than the RF. So it is in effect a square wave, hard switching the LO. And what happens when you switch this with this signal, and we just did this in MATLAB, multiply the two together, Yet this signal out here, now you can see we've still got the RF here, but what you can also see at the different frequency, the IF, you've got a very strong component here. Now, in theory, if everything was perfect, you had lossless diodes and perfect balance, you get about 3.9 dB commercial loss. You don't get anything like that. But this is the theory, this is how it works in theory, and this is why it works in practice. This is a star mixer, <coughs> and it looks dreadfully complicated with these weird balance structures. 
uh, and indeed it, it would be dreadfully complicated if you had to build it out a wire wire or a wound transformers like this. Fortunately, there's quite a nice, elegant way of realising these values using a more channel balance structure, and, and we'll come on to that. So, the main advantages of using a store mixer um, are, well, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's functionally equivalent. However, what you find is that the IF parasitics are a lot lower. And this means you can have a much wider IF bandwidth. So, the, we'll see in the next diagram the, the common point for the star mixer is a virtual earth to both the LO and the RF. So you don't need anything else. You can extract the IF at that point. This is a quad ring mixer, and this is one we designed and manufactured quite a few years ago now. And what you've got is the LO input here, and this is a March and Ballad, and we'll come on and show a little bit more about how this is designed later. And it, it's coupled lines spiraled round, there's an open circuit here, and this is a via in the middle. So via here, via here, and, and we take the differential out here, and these are just open circuits here. And um, on the other side here, what we have to do is find a way to take out the IF. So these two ground points here, we take out to this point here, so a single ground, and we ground it with a capacitor, and we extract the area here from the capacitor. So it's just an RF ground. Now this works pretty well, but it does have its limitations, and its limitations are, this needs to be a good open circuit at the area, and a good short circuit <coughs> at the RF. So you need a gap, and a significant gap between your RF and your area. This is the quad ring structure in the middle. So, how do we design the balance? Well, they're based on a coaxial line ballad invented by a guy called Nathan Marchand in about 1956. And he was messing around in the lab and he started doing a um, ballon using a piece of coaxial cable. And you can do this if you, if you put an RF signal into a piece of coaxial cable, chop the end and look at the signal at the ground and the signal at the centre, you'll have yourself a ballad. And that would be here and here. And what he discovered is if he put another piece of cable here, he got a much better ballad, much broader band. And so you get your differential output here. Now we don't have coaxial cable, but we can make it using coupled lines. So this line, this line. So the overall length of the structure is lambda over two at the centre frequency. It tends to be very broad band, <coughs> and we can get better coupling if we use multiple coupled lines like this. And so now we've got tighter coupling, and you can see the structure looks a bit more like a coaxial cable, even with this and this being the outer and this being the inner, and this works very nicely. For the RF ballon, and we always tend to extract the IF from the RF side, and the main reason for that is that the LO signal is much bigger, and so you'd get more leaking through. So on the RF side, we have this RF ground that I mentioned, and we can extract the IF from here. <coughs> so this is the same in the RF world here, so long as this capacitor is a good RF short. So this is how um, we realised this sort of ballon. And these have been nicely coloured in by my co-author Andy. So you can see how they spiral round together. And so this is the conventional one, with the grounds in the centre. You may recall from the MMIC photograph I showed you, we had a buyer at the centre here. And we take the differential output here. This is the centre tapped, where instead of grounding these in the centre here, we bring them out here and RF ground them at a single point through this capacitor, 
and we can extract the eye out here. And it works great, however, this capacitor needs to be a good RF short and a good IF open, and therein is uh, a limitation. This is an EM simulated um, March and Ballon. Now you can start by simulating these as couple of line structures, but really, to know how they're going to work, you have to EM simulate them. So the good thing is, this is one of the few things that when you design it in a couple, as a couple of line structure and then you EM simulate it, it tends to get a bit better when you EM simulate it. <laughs> That's great. Here's a couple more images. So th this one is showing when you bring it out to a buyer. So some processes allow you to have a capacitor over a buyer, other you need to have the capacitor separate from the buyer. This one, we've got the two buyers at the center. So these are how we build up these and we simulate them and then we put them together with four diodes in a ring and it works. And this is just a circuit schematic showing these two structures as coupled lines. And you can simulate these as coupled lines and they'll work. Then you can lay them out and you can even simulate them and it'll still work. What we can also do is the star mixer. Now when you first start looking at the star mixer, it, it does look a dreadfully complicated button arrangement. And it, indeed it can be, until you realise that it, you can implement these balance quite nicely using coupled line mark channels. And so this is, and the, these are, are just kind of straight rather than spiral structures. Uh, and what we discover is we go up in frequency, um, you tend to move towards having a straight line structure rather than a spiral. And we wind around into a spiral at low frequencies because it saves some space. But for ease of seeing what's going on, we've just got these straight structures. And so you've got these four points, A, B, C, and D, and you connect the diodes like this and extract the IF here. So it's quite a simple structure, but you wonder how on earth do I connect my four diodes to these points? I'm gonna show you that in a minute, um, how you do that. And um, um, so, so your EM structure, your balance, quite straightforward. You've got your four points here. All you need to do now is to work out how to connect these diodes in this star arrangement. Here's one we did earlier. So, you can see these are the diode structures and they all connect to the star point in the center and sorry they all connect to each of the four points the star point in the center of the diodes is actually this ring around here so it's not a zero length point you do have some parasitics but it's small these, these things are like 10 microns these diodes so we've blown it up here so you can see what's going on. But, but this is tiny, even at quite high IF frequencies. So by using this arrangement here, your only IF <coughs> is to these short lengths of line. And these are maybe 30 microns. So you need to get to quite high frequencies before it starts having a significant parasitic effect. So a few simulations now. So we designed a mixer previously six to 22 gigahertz and the IF range was DC to six. Now, actually it was a struggle to work at six because as I mentioned, we really need that RF short to be a good short at the RF and a good open at the IF. So you, you can just about get it working to this crossover point. Um, so what we're gonna do is look at how the simulated performance of this quad ring mixer, the layout of which I showed you on the photograph earlier, how this compares to a star mixer realized on the same process. So this is the conversion loss. So what we see, the quad ring is, it's a little bit higher, higher in conversion loss. In actual fact, when we measured it, I think uh, we actually got slightly lower conversion loss than this. The, the star is slightly lower conversion loss, but you do lose a bit of bandwidth. The quad ring gives you wider bandwidth. This shows the performance versus IF. 
So you can see at this six point six gigahertz point, the quad ring is rolling off like a rocket. That RF short will no longer be a good RF short and a good IF open. The star mixer, however, valiantly carries on up to sort of 11 gigahertz or so, well into the RF frequency range. This is the power compression performance. Not much in it really, the, the quad ring is very slightly better. Um, we're not entirely sure why, to be absolutely honest with you, but slightly better. The IP3, very similar, nothing to choose between the two. Um, we're seeing IP3s of about 23 dBm. I, and when we measured this mixer, it did have an IP3 of about that sort of level. You need to drive it with a reasonable IF, I think, mean, sorry, a, a reasonable LO frequency uh, power to get this sort of IP3. And we drove it with about 15 dBm to get this IP3 performance. And here's the LO to IF isolations. And you get slightly better with the quad ring than um, with the star mixer. However, for the RF to IF isolation, you do a lot better with the star. And that's because with the quad ring, we're extracting the IF from the RF ballot. So there is less scope to get the isolation. Whereas with the star, we've got proper virtual earths of the RF on the IF port. So, in conclusion, the star mix does offer some advantages over the diode ring. Primarily, it has a much better IF bandwidth because of its lower IF parapacitics. It has slightly lower conversion loss and a much improved RF to IF isolation. And these are all due to the lower IF parasitics. It does have some disadvantages. There are a couple of points where the quad ring mixer wins through. The RF bandwidth of the star mixer is limited to about one octave for these MMIC based designs compared to the diode ring where we got a sort of 3.6 <coughs> to one bandwidth um, I, I actually we've done some designs where we, we tease it up a bit beyond this. The layout complexities of the star mixer, uh, there are, it's a little bit more involved than the diode ring, but there is this uh, quite nice approach with the Marchand balance that we've detailed here. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>